In this chapter, Russell starts explicitly stating whether uh, philosophy, and specifically foundational metaphysical beliefs, uh, can be knowledge. And so if you recall what he did in the last chapter, the question really kind of breaking it down is, uh, is it going to be a true belief uh, that's uh, either derived or, or justified with intuition, right, and this highest guarantee of truth? And the, he answers it very quickly, says, well, no. <laughs> and then he spends the rest of the chapter providing an example from Hegel. Okay. But then he, he finishes doing something else. He asks the question, well, then, well, I mean, he at least answer the question, well, then what can philosophy do in terms of knowledge? And his answer is that philosophy uh, is a really fantastic way for, for providing criticism. Well, Russell talks about Hegel. Right? Now, um, the description that Russell gives for Hegel, uh, <laughs> he tries to do, what, two or three pages, what uh, Hegel did in hundreds. And uh, as he said in the text, uh, there's lots of debate about what uh, Hegel has to say. Okay, so I'm not going to try to reproduce Hegel here. I'm not going to try to reproduce everything of what Russell has to say about, about that argument. But what I would like to do is I try to, I'm going to try to illustrate the same point that Russell has by using a much more simplified case. Uh, so let's consider these four statements about uh, objects. Right? These are very commonplace statements. So the first one is that at least some objects have parts. Right? So think about your car. And it's got spark plugs, tires, windshields, uh, a steering column. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of parts in a car. Or even yourself, right? We, we say that we, we are our bodies. We have hearts, lungs, kidney, spleen, skin, bones, eyeballs, hair, everything. You know, all of that we have these parts. We you know, so when we say that they have parts, we're not. You know, what we're saying is that well, there's a distinction between these things. There's a difference between my eyeballs and my heart. Okay. The second uh, claim about objects is that. Uh, at least sometimes, or even you know, majority of the times, uh, objects can survive the loss of parts, even the loss of replacement of parts. So, your car, you, you've, you, know, you might have changed the spark plugs, or got new tires, or had the engine hauled, or something like this. And we think, well, I, you know, I didn't have to go down and file uh, with the DMV with a whole new car. Right? No, you didn't have to do that. And you know, you didn't take your car around to your neighbor and say, "Hey, look at my brand new car." And it's like, didn't you just replace the tires? Well, yeah, but it's a brand new car. Like, no, you, you don't think that. Either. You think that the you still have the same car. You just have a different part. Or even with yourself, right? You, you know, your parts. You you lose parts and you replace them. Your skin. You you lose hundreds of skin cells every day, and it's replaced with new skin. Uh, as a matter of fact, your body is going through a continual process of loss and replacement. Uh, so we got uh, that objects have part, at least some objects have parts. Objects survive the loss or replacement of parts. The third claim is that um, you know more than one object cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So I'm I'm standing here, but there's no chair here at the same place at the same time, right? Uh, I can't uh, walk into and occupy the same space as the camera. I can't uh, occupy the same place space as the floor or anything like that. You know, we think that objects occupy at most one place at a time. And then uh, finally, um, we say that uh, objects, you know, when, you, when you're like looking at me, and you say, well, well, what's there? It's like, well, that, that's, that's the body. What's the body? What's the collection of organs? So at least sometimes, or maybe all the time, right, we think that objects just are the collection of parts. There's nothing more to it than that. So if I you know, sit here and I say, well, here I am. And I say, well, what parts do I have? It's like I got my heart, my brain, my kidney, my lungs, my spleen, my skin, my bones, my eyeballs. I've got all that. And then somebody asks, well, where's your body? I just told you. Right? It's all the parts. You know, imagine going out to your car. And uh, somebody said, hey, uh, where's your car? And said, oh, well, it's right here. And the person said, well, I see the tires and the windshield, the doors, the engine. I see the tailpipe, the tail lights, I, I, I see all of that, but I don't see the car. You know, something is, is wrong there, we would say. Right? If, you have the part, if you have all the parts, you have just the thing. There's nothing more on top of it. Okay. Well, each of these is, is real intuitive, right? We want to keep each of these beliefs. But we have an interesting problem when we consider uh, whether all these beliefs can be true together.
So we're asking the question whether all of these intuitions, these intuitive beliefs about objects, can be true together. Well, consider uh, this cat Tibbles. Now, Tibbles is an unfortunate, you know, is a, you know, is a cat, right? Doing normal cat things, has cat legs, cat head, cat tail, cat body. Right? It, it, it's a cat. Uh, but Tibbles has an unfortunate accident, and Tibbles loses uh, his tail. Uh, say it, you know, had a fortunate accident with a car door right, or something. I don't know. So uh, Tibbles' tail uh, gets separated from Tibbles. Now, for ease of reference, uh, let's call the tail Tib. <laughs> let's call the tail Tib. So we're going to name the tail. Okay. Well, so now here's the question: Did Tibbles survive the loss of his tail? Lot the loss of Tib. Well, I mean, we think so, right? We don't think, oh my gosh, you killed my cat, right? I mean, you're probably saying, oh my gosh, you hurt my cat. <laughs> my cat's tail is now gone. But we don't think that the, you know, the cat has now died. We think that, you know, Tibbles has survived. Well, if you think that, then you're denying that last intuition about Tibbles, right? uh, about objects, right? Because Tib was a part of Tibbles. The cat had parts, legs, tail, head, body, right? The body had heart, lungs, fur, skin, everything else like that. So Tibbles lost Tib, but Tibbles survived. Okay. But if objects just are their parts, then Tibbles did not survive. Something else did survive, right? Something else, or you know, not something else survived, something else began to exist in the place of Tibbles. Now that's now, we don't think that, that that's true. Uh, but So if we say that Tibbles survived, then we're committed to the claim, that, you know, then we're committed to the rejection of that, that fourth claim, that so there's something else to Tibbles than merely the collection of all the parts. Well, suppose you take another way. Suppose you say, well, of course Tibbles survived because Tibbles is not his tail. Now, you don't want to quite reject four. You just want to say, well, you know, Tibbles is, is not his tail. Right. Well, um, well, then what is Tibbles? Because right. it sure seemed like the tail was a part of Tibbles. Do you, you know, do you start like taking away parts? Okay. Well, then what are you doing? Right. You take away the legs, and you say, well, no, Tibbles can survive without legs. You take away the ears, and you say, well, Tibbles can survive without ears. It's getting kind of gruesome at this point. Sorry if you know, it's traumatizing anybody. But uh, you know, the question remains, well, where is Tibbles? What is Tibbles? Well, you know, if you, you know, keep removing parts, <laughs> trying to figure out where, where Tibbles is, it sure seems like you know, you're either going to do one of two things. You're either going to say that uh, yeah, there, there's uh, an essential part of Tibbles that makes Tibbles what he is, and the, the legs and the tail and the ears, that's just kind of added on. Well, if you're doing something like that, you're probably rejecting the first uh, claim. Uh, if you're saying that, well, Tibbles is, is really here, but the rest of it is just kind of extra stuff, and you're saying what well, Tibbles really is has no parts, well, that, that's probably not uh, it's probably not a direction you want to go. Because <laughs> um, then you're saying, well, what happens is you have objects out there with just a whole bunch of other things added on. So no object actually has parts. There's just, you know, the thing that is the object and then some added material. Well, let's try a different approach. Uh, suppose we say, well, no, no, Tibbles did survive, and we're just going to go and reject four. Right? We'll say, well, there's, there's something more to Tibbles than merely the collection of Tibble parts. Okay. So this, we got this Tibbles plus Tib. Right. Now, uh, you know, we would also talk about the legs and the ears and, and everything else. And so we have all, the, all these parts together. Now, all these parts together don't make Tibbles. If we're, reject, we're trying to reject four, we, if we reject four, we say all these things together don't make Tibbles. But if they don't make Tibbles, look what happens. You, know, you have Tibbles occupying this space, but you also have the collection of all the Tibble parts. So now what you have is Tibbles and a collection of Tibble parts. I mean, we... I mean, collections are things, right? We talk about pounds of coffee, we talk about piles of sand, we talk about, yeah, I just said the collection of Tibble parts, and you understood what I'm, what I'm talking about. But if we have both Tibbles and the collection of Tibble parts, then we have two things occupying the same space 
at the same time. So if we reject four, if we reject the idea that things just are their parts, then we have this uh, problem of, of also rejecting three, that we now we have more than one thing existing at a place at a time. Well, suppose you want to avoid this mess altogether. You throw your hands up in the air, tired of dealing with it, say, well, oh, fine, fine, tables just didn't survive. Right? There's something else there. There's whatever it is. Right? And you know, all this time, uh, all this time, tibbles really just didn't survive. Well, <laughs> as I said at the beginning, you're made of parts, and you've lost and replaced parts. Uh, and if you, if you go with that, then you're saying that you... Uh, do not survive a very long amount of time. I mean, as soon as you do this, right, you brush off skin cells. That happens right there. You brush off skin cells. You no longer survive. Now, that's a conclusion you probably don't want to accept. So, uh, trying to figure out where, well, what's happening with Tibbles, or you know, even any of us, when we lose just a little piece of us, and you know, something else replaces it, uh, is not an easy thing. Because these four statements, we want to keep all four of these statements, but rejecting, uh, but they, they can't all be true together. Rejecting any one of them comes with a he very heavy price. So this is the problem that's posed by intuitions. These intu you know, we, we have these intuitions, we have these beliefs, but they can't all be true together. And even you know, some proposed solutions that I, that, you know, to the Tibbles case that I just described, uh, there are some solutions that, that try to account for all four, but usually, uh, almost not usually, almost always they butt up against some other kind of intuition that wasn't listed earlier. So what happens is that these uh, metaphysical theories right, wind up rejecting at least one of these intuitions. Now, logic dictates that we can't keep all of the intuitions. Uh, they're, you know, each of them is plausible, but together they generate contradictions. Okay. But if we can't keep all the... Logic tells us that we can't keep all of the intuitions, but logic doesn't tell us which combination of intuitions we must keep. We can't keep all of them, but it doesn't tell us which subset of the intuitions we, we should keep. <coughs> They're, with these different metaphysical theories, they uh, wind up keeping some, but not all. So logic uh, doesn't tell us which one to accept. And it's in this sense that Russell's saying that uh, logic is freeing, because you, know, you, you can see with these possibilities that are beyond, uh, that are beyond just what's given by, uh, uh, well, just, just what's by given by our empirical knowledge, right? Empirical knowledge, when we talk about having empirical content, um, but it, as Russell is quick to point out, uh, empirical content is always, always, always combined with some kind of a priori knowledge in order to generate beliefs. You know, the principle of inference and the principle of induction are just two of them, the two big ones. And, uh, you know, logic doesn't tell us which subset of these intuitions to keep, but depending on your subset, you're going to have different beliefs about what your empirical content is giving you. And we've already, we've already seen Descartes compared to Berkeley, compared to uh, Hume, compared to Kant. So, um, logic doesn't tell us which subset to keep. Logic, and Russell says, you know, what logic does is it frees us to you know, look at a variety of uh, different approaches. Okay. Now, since um, logic doesn't tell us which subset to keep, uh, there's nothing that tells us uh, which theory is true. So since you know, there's no theory that just comes out on top of all of these uh, different a priori theories, uh, we do not have certainty. And since we don't have certainty, we don't have knowledge. You have probable opinion, okay. You have probable opinion. Some of us have error, right? That, that's going to happen. Um, but uh, most of what you get from philosophy is not knowledge, but it's probable opinion. And Russell, frankly, is just not too uh, confident as to <laughs> how probable that opinion is to begin with. He probably thinks it's closer to true belief than anything, if it's true at all. Now, uh, that doesn't mean... You know, so, so that answers at least the explicit question that Russell gives us at the beginning. Is can we have philosophical knowledge? But that doesn't mean philosophy is without its uses. 
So what philosophy is really great for, Russell says, is criticism. Criticism. Well, what does he mean by that? It doesn't mean that we just sit here and say, oh, all you theories, you're just that. No, it doesn't mean that. What, uh, what philosophy can provide us with is uh, a way of saying, okay, uh, you know, here you have a particular kind of reasoning used in your field, say the sciences, right, physical sciences. Uh, philosophy's task is to question, okay, how is that justified? If it's justified, how is it justified? And then to look at the reasons for that justification, to look at the argument as a whole, and to find coherence. Now, one of the things that philosophy is really excellent at doing is finding this coherence between beliefs. Now, you know, as we talked about last chapter, or two chapters ago, coherence is not enough for truth, but it's very helpful. Coherence is at least necessary for a true belief. The truth isn't going to disagree with itself. But, it's not all there is to truth. So, with this notion of criticism, by asking what justifies our beliefs and having the demand for coherence, we can eliminate at least some error. At least some error. And in that regard, philosophy is useful for the rest of our academic intellectual endeavors.